Hey, Mike, when's our top mechanical genius gonna show Tom and Dutch how that new Power Flight automatic transmission operates? <laughs> right away, Tech, as if you didn't know. We've already covered the external adjustments on the Power Flight transmission, remember? Yeah, Mike. That was a pretty good meeting we had on how to adjust the linkages and the bands. Right. So I thought we ought to take a good close look at the internal parts and figure out how they work. Oh, is that why you've got these parts on the bench? Yeah, Dutch, look. You can see that the power flight transmission is made up mainly of a multiple disc type hydraulically operated clutch we call a direct clutch and two planetary gear sets. Speaking of planetary gear systems, Mike, I think you ought to give these boys a brush up on how a planetary gear set works. Not a bad idea, Tech. It's been a while since we had our overdrive meeting. You fellas know that a typical planetary set has a sun gear. Three planet pinions surround the sun gear and are in mesh with it. Holding the pinions in position is a pinion carrier. Surrounding that carrier and in mesh with the pinions is an annulus gear. Right. A planetary gear set can be used to increase torque and reduce speed, to transmit torque at a one-to-one -one ratio, and to provide a reverse action. You tell them, Mike. Right, o Tech. Increasing torque and reducing the speed is one of the gear combinations we want for moving away from a standing position. For example, uh, let's suppose the sun gear is held stationary. If the annulus gear is rotated while the sun gear is held, the pinions also rotate. Since the pinions are held by the carrier, they force the carrier to revolve in the same direction as the annulus gear, but at a slower rate of speed. That's how the planetary system gives you the 1.72 to 1 gear ratio for starting and also for kick down and low range. Now, suppose that the carrier is held stationary and the sun gear is driven. In this case, the sun gear causes the pinions to rotate in the opposite direction. When that happens, the pinions apply torque to the annulus gear and cause it to rotate in a direction opposite to that of the sun gear. That's the combination that provides reverse. Now, suppose nothing is held, but the annulus and sun gears are driven in the same direction. That gives you a one-to-one -one drive through the pinion carrier. How does that come about, Mike? Well, that happens because the pinions lock the annulus and sun gears together. The entire planetary set revolves as one unit. Good going, Mike. Now, fellas, keep those three gear combinations in mind. They'll help you follow Mike's explanation of power flow through the transmission. Okay, Tech. Now, getting back to the power flight transmission, remember that the clutch and both gear sets are assembled so their operations are tied into each other. Well, uh, I understand how a planetary gear set works okay. But frankly, Mike, when you've got two planetary gear sets and a hydraulically operated clutch all working together, well, I just get confused. <laughs> Tom, my boy, I don't blame you. It does look like a crazy mixed-up arrangement. But it really isn't. And here's one way we can clear it up. Suppose we assemble the parts. Then you'll see how they work together. Start building up from the input shaft, Mike. Well, uh, that's not standard assembly procedure, but it's probably the best way to get the power flow story across. Sounds like a good idea, Mike. But say, how many shafts has this transmission got anyway? <laughs> this unit has two main shafts, Dutch. There's the uh, input shaft to begin with. It carries engine power into the transmission. Sometimes that input shaft is also called the turbine shaft. That's because it carries the turbine of the torque converter on its forward end. Now, secondly, there's the output shaft. This shaft carries the power out of the transmission and drives the rear wheels. I see, Mike. Two main shafts. That clears up those shafts for me too, Mike. But I could use a little more light on that hydraulically operated clutch 
I'm still in the dark on how that works. Okay, Tom, here's the scoop. That clutch is a multiple disc type. It's located just ahead of the two planetary gear sets. The clutch hub is mounted on the transmission input shaft. Now, the clutch itself consists of a piston retainer, a spring-loaded piston, and a clutch hub. Then there's a series of clutch discs and plates. These parts are held in the retainer by the front planetary sun gear. That clutch piston is operated hydraulically to engage the clutch, and it's released by the spring when the hydraulic pressure is relieved. When the clutch is engaged, the retainer is locked to the hub by means of hydraulic pressure, which compresses the discs and plates. Catch on? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mike. You make it mighty clear. You're doing all right, Mike. Now, suppose we get on with putting some of those main parts together so we can trace out power flow. Sure, Tech, and we'll start with a clutch already assembled. Let's get straight on parts names before you get into your story, Mike. Okay. This band, which goes around the clutch piston retainer, is known as the kickdown band. But since it's toward the front of the unit, I like to call it the front band. The other band is called the reverse band because it operates only in reverse. But it's at the rear of the transmission, so uh, let's call it the rear band. The planetary gear sets are easy to keep straight in your minds. Instead of kick down and reverse, just call them front and rear. Good. Now we've got the parts name simplified. Let's get on with the story. We'll just slide the clutch onto the input shaft so the hub splines mesh with the splines on the shaft. Okay, keep going. Okay, we'll slide the front planet pinion carrier over the input shaft next. Notice that we mesh the planet pinions with the sun gear. That sun gear now becomes a part of the front planetary gear set. That's how the clutch and planetary operations are tied together. Let's see. Oh, yeah. All right. Then we'll slip the front annulus gear over the pinion carrier. We mesh the annulus gear with the pinions. And don't forget, fellas, that annulus gear also carries a sun gear. The inside of this sun gear is splined to the input shaft. Right. Next, we'll slide the rear planet pinion carrier over the input shaft and mesh the pinions with the sun gear of the front annulus gear. See? The sun gear now becomes a part of the rear planetary gear set, tying the operation of both planetary gear sets together. Uh, let's take a closer look at that for a minute, Mike. Mm-hmm, I see. The sun gear part of the front annulus gear becomes part of the rear planetary gear set. Correct, Tom. Now, we'll slip the annulus gear of the rear planetary over the pinion carrier, meshing the annulus gear with the pinions. Yeah, and notice that the hub of the annulus gear has internal splines. Those splines mesh with splines on the output shaft. So, keep in mind that the rear annulus gear drives the output shaft. Good reminder, Tech. Now we'll slide the planet pinion carrier housing over both carriers. You'll notice that each carrier has lugs around the outer edge. Those lugs around the edge fit into notches inside the housing. Therefore, when the pinion carriers rotate, the lugs drive the housing. So one carrier can't rotate without the other. Yeah, just like a lot of lugs I know. All they do is drive, drive, drive. <laughs> All right, Tech, off my back. I've still got to talk about the band. <laughs> okay, Mike, but before you do that, somebody better turn this record over. I was wondering about that front transmission band, Mike. What actually makes it operate? Well, hydraulic pressure is actually the force behind that front band operation. But mechanically... The kickdown, or front servo, applies and releases the band. That servo, in itself, consists of a piston, piston rod, two springs, and a piston rod guide. 
The piston operates in a cylinder or bore formed as part of the transmission case. The servo is actuated hydraulically, like I said before. But that front servo's not all, eh, Mike? That's right, Tech. There are two servos in the transmission. Besides the front servo, there's a reverse or rear servo which operates the rear band. Both servos are similar in construction, and both, of course, use levers, struts, and links to apply and release the bands. Well, that sure answers my question. What's next, Mike? Why, uh, you and Tom remember that we assemble these parts so we could explain mechanically how power flows through the transmission. So without going into how the hydraulic system operates, suppose I cover the flow of power during each of the forward speeds and in reverse. Sounds swell, Mike. Where are you going to start? In drive range, Tech. For instance, fellas, when the selector lever is moved to the D position, the front band is applied. Applying the front band keeps the sun gear of the front planetary gear set from turning. But that's not all that happens. The sun gear of the rear planetary gear set is splined to the input shaft. It is also a part of the front gear set annulus gear. So, when the input shaft turns, it drives the annulus gear of the front planetary set. Now, since the front sun gear is held stationary, the front planet pinions revolve around it as they are driven by the annulus gear. That naturally causes the pinion carrier to revolve. Uh, hey, wait a minute, Mike. You said the front pinion carrier revolves because the pinions go around the stationary sun gear as they're driven by the annulus gear, right? Yeah, that's what happens. Well, you also said the front pinion carrier is hooked up to the carrier housing. So, if the carrier evolves, that's going to turn the housing, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is, Tom. And that housing isn't all it's going to turn. It's going to drive the rear carrier. Remember, one can't turn without the other. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot they were both tied up together. Okay, uh, now what happens next? Well, keep in mind that the rear sun gear is being driven by the input shaft. In addition, the pinion carrier is being driven by the housing, and the planet pinions drive the rear annulus gear. This produces a gear reduction of 1.72 to 1. Don't forget, the hub of the rear annulus gear is splined to the output shaft. So the power from transmission to rear wheels is transferred by way of the hub and the output shaft. Nice going, Mike. That explains the 1.72 to 1 ratio and covers the flow of power when the transmission starts out in drive range. Right, Otec. Now, the power follows a different path as the transmission automatically upshifts into direct drive. For example, when car acceleration reaches the point of change from breakaway or starting speed to direct drive, two things happen. First, oil pressure to the offside of the front servo causes it to release pressure against the front band. So the front band is released from the clutch retainer. Releasing the front band releases the front planetary sun gear because it's attached to the retainer. So the retainer and sun gear are free to turn. Secondly, oil pressure is directed to the clutch piston. So, the clutch is applied. Applying the clutch locks up the clutch hub with a piston retainer by means of the clutch discs and plates. Glad you mentioned that hub, Mike. We should remind the boys that the clutch hub is splined to the input shaft. Oh yeah, Tech, good point. Because that hub is splined to the shaft, the drive through the clutch is from the input shaft through the hub through the discs and plates to the piston retainer and to the front planetary sun gear. You can see then that the front sun gear turns at input shaft speed. And while that's going on, fellas, the rear planetary sun gear is also busy. You gonna tell the boys, Mike? You bet, Tech. Tom and Dutch will remember 
that the rear planetary sun gear is splined to the input shaft. It's also a part of the front annulus gear. So, when the sun gear and annulus gear are both driven at input shaft speed, the pinions of the front planetary are locked between the annulus and sun gears. Therefore, the front pinion carrier is also being driven at input shaft speed, or a one-to-one -one ratio. You follow that? Uh, I think I understand that okay, but tell me, isn't that front pinion carrier driving the carrier housing? It sure is. That carrier is hooked up with a housing. So the carrier and housing both turn at input shaft speed. Now, at the same time, you may have noticed that the rear annulus gear is being driven by the rear planet pinions. That happens because the rear pinions are locked between the sun and annulus gears. So you won't be surprised to learn that the hub of the annulus gear transmits the power to the output shaft and drives it at input shaft speed. In other words, then, there is direct drive from the input shaft to the output shaft by way of the clutch and both planetary sets. boy, Mike. Good job. Now, suppose you cover the flow of power when the selector lever is put into reverse. Okay, Tech, here's how that power flow goes. When the selector lever is moved to reverse position, oil pressure is routed to the rear servo only. You mean there's no oil pressure to the clutch or the front servo? Exactly, so the clutch and the front band are in their released positions. Routing oil pressure to the rear servo causes it to apply the rear band around the carrier housing. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happens then? Well, power is applied through the input shaft. And that, of course, drives the rear planet sun gear. You already know that the rear pinion carrier is attached to the housing. And I've just told you that the housing is kept from turning by the band. So, in this case, the planet pinions rotate backward. Now, as those pinions rotate backward, they drive the rear annulus gear backward. What happens? Why, the hub of the annulus gear also turns backward. And that, in turn, drives the output shaft backward. So that's what gives a reverse direction of rotation to the propeller shaft, and naturally reverses the rotation of the rear wheels. That about covers the flow of power, fellas. Now, don't be bashful about asking questions. Don't worry, Tech. If Mike doesn't make it clear, we'll chew his ear off all right. I am kind of wondering whether anything special happens when the selector lever is in neutral. Good question, Dutch. Want to handle it, Mike? Well, okay, Tech, but uh, nothing special happens. The gears will be turning because both bands and the clutch are released. But no power is being transmitted to the output shaft. I see, Mike. I understand that mechanical flow of power a lot better now. Me too, Mike. Those adjustments we talked about last month on the front and rear bands and on the linkages seem to make a lot more sense to me now. Well, they certainly should, Tom. Yeah, but all this hydraulic business is way over my head. When are you going to explain that part of the transmission? Atta boy, Dutch. Keep his nose to the grindstone. <laughs> well, frankly, Dutch, the hydraulic system is too big a subject to cover right now. But I know how you feel, so the hydraulic system is the subject of our next meeting. That's fine. The quicker you fellas get the whole story on how this power flight transmission operates, the better you're going to be able to serve our customers. Naturally, the better our customers are served, the more they'll keep coming back to us. And that's exactly what all of us want. Thank you.